We use a ton of AI to make the show, but we're also mimicking how people feel about AI and how it expresses itself to us. I'm Jake Barton. I designed the projections for McNeil and co-designed the sets with Michael Jurgen. And because of the nature of the play, because it deals both with artificial intelligence and on many levels what is real and not real, it's essentially building this whole world of the play, both from a literal standpoint, but also the larger figurative universe. Most of my career has been designing museums, and I was doing a talk about the work that I've done, museums like the 9-11 Museum or Greenwood Rising at Sun Valley. And Ed Akhtar, who's the playwright, and I got in multiple deep discussions about the future of AI. And we've done work for IBM, and, and I happen to have a, a sort of deep understanding of it. And within that context, he said, I want to send you this play, get your opinion on it. And so I read the play, and we had a couple of uh, words on it. And then he was like, I want to bring Bart, the director, by to hear your thoughts on it. And within five minutes, Bart was like, do you want to direct the projections? And I was like, yeah, I would definitely do that. The original intention was to have these sort of interstitial moments in between the main scenes within the play that sort of represent how AI is working and it's mysteriously sort of driving the play and also responding to the play. That allows you to not just experience it but just be inside of the thinking really of how AI is developing the play itself is a big thrust uh, for the performance. At the beginning of the performance, it's very literal. You literally see a giant iPhone standing in front of you and you hear the little clicking and clacking and the typing and it's essentially very familiar. But as the play moves on, the icons within that app, which represents the AI in the prologue and in the first scene, starts to really develop a mind of its own. And it starts to scan different books and then it scans different journals. And some of the journals it's scanning start to show up later in the performance. And then it starts to almost seemingly talk a little bit about the play itself that you're watching, all the way until in the final scenes, it really takes on a life of its own. If you think about projection design in this case as world building, it was really, really important that the author, the fictional author McNeil, have the type of stature that would lead to a Nobel Prize in literature. And so I took it upon myself to work with a team to basically build out the designs for the fictional books that he built. Interestingly enough, Robert and his team, along with Ed, had already written out not just the titles of the books, but small blurbs on the books, essentially for him to really understand the depth of the character. So I took those, took it on as a design assignment, and essentially created the actual books themselves. So when you see them on stage, they've been designed, they actually have blurbs on the back, uh, but it really gives that sense of authenticity to McNeil as a character, because they look like actual proper books that you would get at that level of stature. The main inspiration points for the look of McNeil was really artificial intelligence itself. Essentially, AI is almost like a series of nets that information is filtering through, becoming less and less of these sort of abstraction clouds of data into specific first characters and then words and then phrases and ultimately the larger essays and books and everything that AI is authoring. And so the language within the play is all these tiny little strands of connections within the app itself. And then as the, what we call the AI sphere is traveling around, it starts to build out all these different connections. And it's almost a comment on the audience's own journey. Right, they're making the same connections that AI is leading them through. And that's really a sort of metaphor for both AI as well as Robert and McNeil itself. So there's a lot of experiences within McNeil that are not only connected to actual performances, but are contingent on them. So that, we have a scene where essentially McNeil is sort of in this giant storm, first of words and then of characters, and it, people are sort of flipping around him constantly. We actually use technology to track exactly where Robert's performance is, both with his hands and with his body. And he's almost playing those projections, almost like an instrument. He's able to control them and shift them and move them around. And if you've seen in the performance, it's almost like a storm is sort of collecting around his person. That's because we literally have sensors that are doing live 360 readings of exactly where his body is. And he's almost, again, playing the, the performance like an orchestra. We have these scenes where you see first McNeil, and then you see McNeil switching into both other characters, and then also political figures that you'll recognize. Hilariously enough, we have shots 
where the actor Robert Downey Jr. is having his own face replaced by AI with another version of Robert Downey Jr. because the original shots looked too authentic. We wanted to match all the other face swapping shots. But I think the point there is you're inside of McNeil's head in this moment of crisis and you're almost seeing like his subconscious spill out all in front of him and around him and seeing those connections that he's made throughout his life. He's written books, for example, on Reagan. Suddenly Reagan appears speaking his own words back to him. It's a complete AI-induced fever dream that he's at the epicenter of. You know, a lot of AI is very, very technical and can be quite cold and quite disarmingly uninteresting. So how to make it so that it becomes a world that pulls you in deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. And ultimately how we designed that first app, and it literally is designed almost like an AI app in and of itself. That language snowballs and evolves and twists and changes literally around the characters. So by the end, you're sort of almost inside of that AI world, experiencing it for yourself. I mean, I think the interesting thing about, in particular, one of the first major artworks being done about AI is that it's being done in the theater. The most human of art forms that we have at this point is literally watching other humans do things. And in that way, it's very, very ancient. So it's super interesting, both in terms of speed and in terms of capacity, that the theater is where we would first be confronted with these very near future questions about what are we if we're just looking to AI to produce things in the future? And what does that mean for people who are creative? And what does that mean for our society itself? And this play really builds on a lot of the ways in which artists have been essentially stealing material to create their own work for a long time and makes a parallel between human authorship and AI authorship and starts to really confront some of these really deep but salient questions about what will we be like in five or 10 years if and when we've seeded whole chunks of our creativity to computers. I think there is something ineffable about human connection, which is at the heart of art itself. And that's obviously something that AI isn't gonna provide. To the extent that a lot of art or performance or genre work is increasingly formulaic, that's the stuff that AI is gonna be really good at. So I think if anything, it will you know, pierce people's curiosity to be more inventive, more unique, and more human in terms of its connection, because those are, again, are the things that AI is really bad at. I think we're, we're still in an interim moment where AI is a tool that you can leverage. Certainly for the work that can be reproduced by a computer, lots and lots of that work will be reproduced by a computer. Like that's, that's a given for sure, and that's happening in law, that's happening in medicine, that's happening across the board. So that's, that's the tough news. And I think it's particularly tough for young people because those are jobs that they used to get in order to break into different industries. So that's very, very challenging. That said, I do think that the value of having a person that you care about or that you think is interesting, whether it's a celebrity or a neighbor, that connection is really ultimately what's gonna drive art and art's importance. We don't like Taylor Swift because algorithms tell us that we should. She's just freaking amazing, right? And you have that connection with her. She's way bigger than bands have been in the past. Like just no question. And where is she big? It's not in recording, it's in the live show. Because no matter what, AI is not gonna produce another version of Taylor Swift. So that's really the ultimate question for artists is how can you get to that level of connection with an audience to make that human connection that AI can't produce, that their phones can't produce? Because that's really the race in terms of art at this point. It's like what can make people feel things in ways that, you know, frankly, their phones or algorithms don't already. And part of that also is producing something that's worthy of people getting off their couch and not looking at their phones in order to be in front of an audience. And so that's really where artists need to come to the forefront to figure out new ways to connect with other humans.